Hi, good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome all our guests and members tonight for this conversation with Erin Genoa Gilbert on the occasion of the exhibition Shakaya Booker, The Observance, that is currently on view at ICM Miami throughout October, curated by Alex Gartenfeld and myself. Our guest tonight will talk about Shakaya Booker's work in relation to an essay that she has contributed to the exhibition catalog on this exhibition that is forthcoming and currently in production and that will be published later this year with Hermer Publishing. I would like to also take the opportunity to thank our donors and lenders who supported this exhibition at ICM Miami as well as the publication and tonight's Zoom, as well as all digital initiatives at ICM Miami are supported by the generosity of the Knight Foundation. So I would like to briefly introduce our guest tonight. Welcome, Erin. Erin Juno Gilbert is a New York-based curator and art advisor specializing in modern and contemporary art of the African diaspora. Most recently, the curator of African-American manuscripts at the Smithsonian Archives of American Art Gilbert has held positions at the Art Institute of Chicago and the Studio Museum in Harlem. She holds a BA in political science and a BA in African and African American studies from the University of Michigan, as well as an MA in contemporary art from the University of Manchester. In terms of uh, her curatorial focus, Gilbert explores the relationship between art, power, and politics and examines the physical and psychological connection to land the trauma of displacement and the black female body as contested terrain. Gilbert recently curated A Force for Change, which is an exhibition presenting 26 contemporary women artists of African descent in New York benefiting the UN women. And she's also the co-curator of the exhibition of Mary Lovelace O'Neill, which will open at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco in October, 2022. Before we jump into our conversation, I would also like to give a little background uh, about the artist that we're talking about tonight, which is Shakaya Booker. Um, Shakaya Booker was born in 1953 in Newark and has made a number of public art commissions, including the Millennium Park in Chicago, the Garmin District uh, in New York, as well as the National Museum of Women and the Arts and their New York Avenue Sculpture Project in Washington, D.C. She was featured at, in retrospectives at the Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum in Lincoln, Massachusetts, as well as the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art in Kansas City, Missouri. Shakaya Booker has participated in numerous group exhibitions that include exhibitions at the National Museum of Women in the Arts and uh, the National Art Museum of China in Beijing, as well as the Whitney Biennial in 2000 which first introduced her work to a larger audience. Her work is also held in the collections of the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the Whitney Museum of Art, as well as the National Museum of African American History and Art in Washington, DC. And Booker has received Paulo Krasner grants as well as a Guggenheim Fellowship. So without further ado, welcome Erin. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you um, to everyone who's joined us, to Alex, and of course to Shakaya for inviting me both to write for the catalog and to uh, speak really on her behalf this evening. I'm very excited. Thank you so much. Um, to jump right in, so I mentioned briefly in the introduction, uh, you were till recently a curator of African American manuscripts at the Smithsonian. Uh, in Washington, where you actually acquired Shakaya Booker's archives um, for the museum archives. And I was curious how and where you first encountered Shakaya Booker's work and what started to get you interested in and basically then eventually sparked your interest to acquire her archive for the Smithsonian. You know, I can't remember exactly uh, the first time that I saw Shakaya's work. And I don't say that because it wasn't memorable. I say because it was so long ago now. I feel like it may have been um, during my first job at the Art Institute of Chicago <laughs> many years ago, but it feels like I've been engaging with her work somehow or another for the last 15 years um, and have thought about it in terms of its really, um, innovative qualities, it's um, qualities of distinction. It's not like any other sculpt 
director's work that I've ever encountered. Um, and one that I um, have been intrigued by for many years. Um, I did uh, seek Shakaya out prior to my being at the Smithsonian and had hoped to develop a relationship with her, you know, as a curator who was interested in her practice. And we really did get to know one another better in the process of my collecting her papers for the Smithsonian Archives of American Art. I, um, as you mentioned, focus really on um, women artists, women artists of the Deep South and of the Global South. And I'm really always thinking through Black female artists whose contribution to the canon may have been overlooked or is absent for some reason. And from the museological standpoint, um, Shakaya's sculptures are obviously throughout almost 40 collections. And so she has been highly successful and highly critically acclaimed in that area. But in terms of thinking through the ways in which um, the canon is operated you know, by the archive and how it is that the documentation of an artist's um, education and their um, exhibition history, their publication history, and even their diaries, their notes, their kind of trajectory as an artist is evidenced in the archive. I was really interested in making sure um, that she was present in that space. And we got to know one another during that process. I did visit her space in New York uh, several times and had many conversations with her as we kind of determined what she was comfortable with allowing to go to the archives because archives must be primary source documents. And so for the most part, um, there aren't copies and they need to be something that, you know, cannot be easily located by others. Um, and as we, you know, go through the exhibition images, um, some of the first things that I really encountered were her graveyard series, a series of images of her collecting um, uh, tires and inner tubes and bones. And really, you know, from there on, our conversation really became about what that kind of materiality, um, finding materials and the found object really meant. And I think we, we have a slide uh, for that that shows these uh, early photographs. Um, if we can just go to the next slide. Um, where we see actually Shakaya in um, a space, I believe that was in Queens. That exactly. was exactly. It's a graveyard in Queens, and you know what's so interesting is you know for me not just the kind of uh, beauty of Shakaya really sitting on this throne that's a you know a computer a discarded computer tower, but really her intimate engagement with the tires with the inner tubes in a space that one might think of as somehow frightening or scary because it's a haunted space or a space where there has been not just discarded objects but discarded bodies, but really one in which you know I I feel, I sense her finding sanctuary in that space. Um, and as we kind of go through the images and think about her practice, it's the cross made of bones on her chest that really also stood out to me um, within the context of this series of images and became, a, became another point of conversation between she and I, this idea of spirituality and how that may have been um, imbued throughout the sculpture. That's a really interesting point. And actually, um, before we move on, I was just wondering, it sounds so interesting to go through these archives and acquire them. And I was wondering if you could maybe share also what, what was part of these archives that you, um, that you secured for the museum eventually? Yeah, I'm happy to. You know, for the most part, what was in Shakaya's archive or what is now in her archive at the Smithsonian is a series of documents that really trace her trajectory from um, right out of CUNY to um, the current moment. So thinking through not just her education, but the ways in which she began to present and represent herself in the context of moving from um, graduate school into um, her galleries and into you know, the Whitney Biennial, um, several reviews, several newspaper articles, um, several early kind of um, invitations. You could think through this being a bit before the moment where everything was digitized and a bit mm -hmm. before the moment where you had everything on some type of hard drive or some type of electronic document. So a lot of what is in the archives now are the things that she kept for herself um, 
you know, some things that I think all artists uh, keep because they want to not just be reminded of what they've done, but to give them reminders of what they want to do. So sometimes, you know, there were notes, sticky notes, sometimes there um, were and are uh, notes written on, you know, that long legal pad paper. Um, I think for Shakaya, one of the things that I found really interesting and talk about in this essay is the series of binders that she had that she brought um, with her into uh, galleries and museums to, to promote her own practice and to explain um, what she was doing and what she is doing. And in that early binder, in those early binders rather, you do see not just these images of Shakaya, but also images of her wearing the wearable um, sculptures that she made early on, also out of rubber um, tires and inner tubes, which I also found really fascinating, that kind of intersection between fashion and art that was at the beginning of her practice very evident as well and really translates into the kind of physical production that is Shakaya entering the space right she's you know always wearing a headdress she's always wearing layered fabrics from head to toe she is really yeah I think uh, regal in her presentation of self and all of that kind of identity formation. You can also see through the um, archive and, and within it, she also talks a little bit about how um, she would like to be positioned, how she is thinking through um, not just the notion of um, the environment, which I think many have written about and thought about is how these um, retrieving discarded objects has been a way for her to contribute to recycling and to, you know, um, efforts around climate change, but also, um, again, the kind of spiritual aspect of thinking through the relationship between these discarded objects and the Black body in America. Thank you so much. And I believe there, there's another slide with a similar series that is called The Founding Warrior Quest, where we also see Shakaya um, salvaging materials from a different site, which is which were originally pho photographed around the same time. But these are lithographs from 2010. And in the exhibition, the Graveyard series is presented as a large photo wallpaper. But thank you for sharing this. Mm -hmm. um, so moving further into the exhibition, um, the show features not only um, this very um, iconic rubbers, rubber tire sculptures, but also a series of paintings, photographs, collages, bronzes. Um, we see here a piece called Over the Rainbow in the front that uses, um, as you mentioned already, re recycled items, which are um, water gallon containers and um, ca like metal cans um, as food is canned in. There is cl uh, clay piece, um, so there's a real broad range of media, and this is a bit of a tricky question, but in your catalog essay, which is titled Shakaya Booker Transcendence and Transfiguration, you mention a couple of themes that you see at the core of her work, and um, I wanted to see if you could share some of these with us. Yeah, I mean, I first of all, congratulations on what really is a beautiful show, all the installation shots that, you know, you all shared with me throughout this process have truly been amazing. And I look forward to seeing the exhibition in person and really hope anyone in the area will get to see this exhibition because Shakaya certainly deserves to have all of these diverse media presented simultaneously. It's something that I have great admiration for her um, because as you say, she is known as a sculptor and is certainly a sculptor, but has all of these um, ways in which she has begun to think through materiality and this idea again of discard, of degradation, um, of a certain kind of um, you know way in which this materiality does repeat itself. And, I find one of the things outside of um, the probably most obvious monochromatic presentation, right? The color that she continually uses throughout all of this is black. She tends to kind of um, burn or char or somehow um, ensure that the object itself 
has a residue that renders it somehow obsidian, somehow black. Um, and I think that is one of the themes, but there's also this kind of um, way in which things are modular, um, things have a monumental quality, um, you know, she's methodical in her production. Uh, something she and I have talked a lot about is the idea of labor. You know, these kind of intricate ways in which each and every shard, each and every kind of coil she does by hand and she applies this rubber to these structures that she's created with tiny nails and is really so intentional. That kind of repetition I find throughout all of her practice. Um, and I really do believe that there is somehow also a um, calligraphic, almost musical quality to the way in which um, these objects sometimes have a very specific kind of symmetry, but then also sometimes feel very symphonic and very musical and move outside of um, that, the very kind of um, two-sided symmetrical object to the asymmetrical, but somehow, you know, melodic and, and or calligraphic quality that they have. Thank you. Yeah, and we've seen some some views here of all the different um, scales, and it is really um, from witnessing the installation of the exhibition so fascinating to see them come together. A lot of them are modular, and um, even some structures can change according to the exhibition venue. We have the large piece, yeah. it's called manipulating fractions that we saw in one of the early yeah. slides that will always be configured differently. And it's, it's also incredible how sturdy and um, well thought through all these objects mm -hmm. are. And if we maybe go to the next slide, there's also the observance, which is uh, eponymous with the exhibition's title that was redone for the first time since 95, since Shakaya Booker had first presented that, which is a large hanging piece that people can walk through. Mm -hmm. Um, taking a little bit of a step back, you had already mentioned that um, Shakaya Booker did her master's at CUNY in New York, and I wanted to uh, loop back to that and see if you could talk to people who may, may have influenced her artists directly or indirectly as teachers, but also um, in terms of art historical connections to the rubber tire that is um, uh, has made appearances in a number of artists' works. Yeah, you know, again, in the context of collecting her papers, um, there were a series of letters, a series of cards, you know, um, and, and some photographs, some that are in the archives now, some that are not, um, but a particular kind of stack or section from Al Loving stood out to me. And at the time, Shakai wasn't really ready to part with them, but we did talk about those letters and we did talk about those communications. And she shared out with me how much of an impact Al Loving had had on her career because he was a professor of painting at the time she was at CUNY. And what I find most interesting in thinking about the similarities between the two, neither of, neither of whom would be thought of in a traditional painting practice, right? Both of whom, um, have this kind of lineage that they come from that really is a lineage of seamstresses, a lineage of people who create objects from fabric and, you know, have created objects in the case of Al Loving from discarded fabric, from, you know, uh, the scraps, as they say, of uh, seamstresses uh, floors and he turned those into these kind of monumental assemblages and you kind of um, or, and you know thinking through the sacred geometry of quilts and the quilting practice and the women of G's band and thinking through the ways in which he moved from a kind of to uh, a very flat surface into this uh, multi-dimensional um, creation of uh, you know installations, one might call them, but really tapestries. I find that Shakaya um, reworked that idea that she had come from also a legacy of seamstresses, that she'd come from a legacy of women who 
also used fabric and who sewn. And again, we've spoken about the ways in which she's made wearable objects, but in the way in which she fashions herself, um, you know, moving from that idea into using the discarded tire and into kind of shredding and sharding. And in this case, allowing them to hang, allowing those kind of coils and spirals to, um, you know, fall all the way to the floor or to spiral out in the case of it's so hard to be green. You know, there's these ways in which I think Shakaya was influenced, but as any great artist was not going to imitate his practice or really imitate anyone's practice. Um, you know, I find that having seen and studied Marcel Duchamp's bicycle wheel or um, Robert Rochenberg's um, automobile tire print or, you know, monogram by John Chamberlain, um, you know, I'm sorry, monogram um, by uh, Rochenberg or Chamberlain Shortstop or even Alan Cockrow's Installation Yard, you, she had seen, of course, these kind of ways in which the tire had been used by predominantly white male artists and at the time those who were at the forefront of contemporary artistic practice and again not to think through um, imitation but to really innovate around that idea her having not used the tire as its ready-made full-on object but to really again take the discarded tire and to degrade it further to uh, separate it to um, take its dislocation as a cue to dismember it and then to kind of Re, uh, reassemble it in a new way, uh, not just as um, an object of decoration, but an object of some symbolism in my mind, you know, um, thinking through the relationship between the black body, um, the discarded tire, and letting that be a metaphor for the ways in which black or African-American people in particular dislocated within the United States context and dispersed within the United States and the diaspora then um, had been uh, set aside or discarded from many employment and education opportunities, but really converting that from a position of powerlessness into a position of power and into a kind of ugly experience into a very beautiful um, experience is what I believe Shakaya has done in thinking through the use of the tire and its relationship to uh, the black body. What I, I love most in many ways is this ambulatory quality, this kind of way in which you need to walk around and through these objects. You can't just simply engage with them you know, uh, from the screen or even, you know, standing in front of a flat surface. It really is about um, your body's relationship to them. And in many ways about that smell, about the char, about the ways in which the kind of tread itself retains the residue of the New York City streets on which she found them or the graveyard or the, you know, kind of empty uh, car lots in which she finds or found these uh, treads as she calls them. Um, I found most interesting and most um, innovative in, in her use of what um, was already a part of the canon, was already a part of a very interesting dialogue around American um, consumerism, around capitalism itself, around the idea of the American dream. Um, she really, um, I think, confronts and challenges that idea by uh, taking what is the symbol of capitalism or the symbol at the time of mobility and really deconstructing that. Um, so I've, I've found that the influences that I might mention, whether they are, you know, as I mentioned, Rauschenberg or Chamberlain or even Duchamp or Capro, um, you know, are, are ones that she uh, was influenced by to change, to shift, to challenge, rather than to simply kind of imitate. And then there are another set of influences that, you know, as a woman, I think I'm always wanting to draw parallels between, uh, you know, women sculptors, especially African American or Black women sculptors, and Louise Nevelson or Louise Bourgeois or, you know, Eva Hesse. But really, uh, I think that the other influence for Shakaya is African sculpture. And I think, you know, knowing that she studied basket weaving and knowing that she studied um, African dance and knowing that she had been looking at uh, objects 
uh, not just from Africa, but from Asia and had been thinking through the ways in which um, sculpture and or the outdoor engagement with a form can be totemic, can be a ritual object, can be a power object, I think is what's happening within the context of the sculpture and, and installations that she presented us with today. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and maybe we can actually jump to a few of these um, images and works that you just talked about. I believe there is a slide of L. Loving and one of his paintings. If we could go forward, there it is. Yeah, this this one in particular, I think, became Im, Im, you know emblematic of L. Loving and became emblematic of his way in which, as a young kind of man out of the University of Michigan and out of Detroit, really, you know, becoming the first African American uh, to have a solo show at the Whitney. And that kind of way in which he really did integrate the museum at a very uh, intense moment, obviously not with this work and not with work like this, but um, with painting as a practice and thinking through how after that experience where he was engaged with what was considered a depoliticized picture plane um, you know, because abstraction in that moment, as in this moment, I think is one where uh, it is rare that we, and I you know I consider myself one who's engaged with the practice of, of politicizing and allowing there to be a racial, a way in which one can read an object um, from its ethnographic and or cultural and or social and in many cases racialized um, points of production. But in that particular moment, with that kind of debate around what is black art, um, you know, for someone to present it the way he did without the black figure was seen as deracialized. And so the change in his practice to go and use these kind of objects, these, these discarded objects that, as I mentioned, are, you know, a part of his family lineage, also a part of this, this idea of um, the ways in which Black folks, African Americans at the time, dealt with using the scraps, dealt with discard, um, and made of it um, really <laughs> amazing um, products. Um, and for everyday life, and for decoration, and you know, for in this particular case, artworks that would move into the museum spaces, I think um, is 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 a part of the Black experience, and one where um, again, this, this um, way in which abstraction would allow him through material to speak to his experience as a uh, man of color, um, African-American man in a particular moment, I think became a cue to many artists, including Shakaya, as to how they might retain and to think through um, a conversation that would engage race um, and that would allow for discussion around the Black experience in America without being figurative, without rendering the Black figure itself as a part of that artistic um, expression. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think, and also formally, this is fascinating to see them side by side with the these works like manipulating fractions. Um, exactly. Exactly, but you know, and as I look at this, the one that I mentioned to you earlier um, that I thought about um, is the flag, the, the flag that uh, Shakaya created um, that I knew as Feeding Frenzy, I believe the version that you all have at the museum is a larger different version, but one that changes the direction of the flag, but still uses these strips. And as you said, you know, they, those are race car tires. So, you know, in thinking about the tire and in thinking about the word race and the many kind of uh, connotations and denotations of the word race, not just that it's about this track and about this kind of way in which there's a specific kind of speed, but also race itself. And so that black on black flag um, in, the, in a vertical as opposed to horizontal direction, I think has meaning and resonates for me along the lines also of this particular our loving work. Thank you. Yeah. And maybe just to give context to what you said earlier, I believe there's also a few images of um, Alan Capro and Robert Rauschenberg, just to see different uses of the tire here. Exactly. Um, where this is all found tires that are stacked up. Um, 
And I think the next slide. Yeah. Should... I... Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no. I, I was just saying, you know, again, this, this idea of consumption, of conspicuous consumption, and of thinking through um, ways in which, in this particular moment, we um, or human beings had to come out of um, the excitement of the industrial age to kind of thinking through what or the ramifications of this overproduction of our, and overconsumption. And obviously, you know, Capro had been thinking that through as well. What I think is interesting about that title, the title of that work is Environments and Situations. And you think back to how Shakaya at early in her career called herself a narrative environmental sculptor. So in that same way that the environment, you know, became important to her, but but the but the idea not just of looking at and of toying with the objects in the these kind of environments, but really the narrative attached to them is something that I began to think about. Why would she call herself a narrative environmental sculptor if there was not also a narrative, a story that she wanted to tell? And so that became, again, one of these distinctions, I thought, between the ways in which she was dealing with the tire and the way that, again, even Rauschenberg, you know, as you know and have in the show, Shakaya has made prints. She has thought through this idea of, you know, again, utilizing the tread within the context of a work on paper, in her case, Chana Kole. And I, I love those works as well, but to, again, to kind of think through it as a dismembered object and not to just simply render it so that it's, you know, almost unrecognizable. I think what's so interesting, um, and I, I would argue that, you know, of course, today people would recognize that there these are tires, but, you know, if, if perhaps for some reason we don't drive cars in the same way 50 years from now and someone encounters this object, the idea of the tire uh, may not be as recognizable because she does dismember them to the point of um, them being really new, really a, a material in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. And a material that, you know, just to, as we can go through the images, but in thinking about this higher, um, one of the things that, you know, in reading so much about Shakaya's practice and in thinking about how I might, um, you know, really uh, position the materiality at the forefront of um, my essay was to think about the origin of the tire itself and to think about not just the kind of, um, ways in which it's consumed, but how it was produced and the original production and, and not just the um, material and the physicality of the material, but the psychic conditions under which that material was produced. So thinking through the fact that the tire um, and that rubber you know, was tapped primarily in Africa, right? And so this idea that Harbel in Liberia had been and has been the site for Ford Motor Company's plant or plantation, um, you know, rubber plantation for many years. Um, and that, you know, out of Africa came all of the rubber that then went to Detroit, both for Ford and for the big three, really. But really, those spaces, Harbel, Liberia, and then Detroit, Michigan, where so many of these tires were produced are places where black bodies engaged with um, the making of the tire. So in her kind of reclaiming that and thinking through it and engaging with, um, you know, the tire itself, she also engages with the residue of a series of ancestors, both within the African context and within the context of um, those working in the plants in um, Detroit that really allow her to um, engage with this object in a in a different way. It's almost as though one could say that you know this kind of set of ancestral hands both made and then unmade and then remade um, these tires. Yeah, and I think the oh, I'm sorry. There is a slide uh, if we can continue from the Ford assembly line actually. Yeah, you know, it's it's really interesting how things come to you, but I attended the University of Michigan for undergrad, and one of the things that stood out to me was this really elite class of African American students, most of whom were studying engineering, and they were brilliant, and they all had cars, and they all had these big trucks, and you learn early on that their parents and their parents' parents had worked for one of the big three for many years, whether it was Chrysler, whether it was Ford, whether it was GM, and so I had that early exposure to understanding both this legacy of an African-American, you know, upper middle class that came out of the automobile industry, but then also, you know, 
Ann Arbor is an hour away from Detroit, but also when you get to Detroit, how very, um, how very um, empty the city center was and how very kind of bankrupt in many spaces the city had been. And in the context of this essay, what was so interesting was to go back and do this research and think through how it went from being um, this center of production of tires and of production of cars and a space that allowed for an amazing number of African Americans to migrate, you know, again, this idea of transportation to migrate from the South to the north to begin working um, within the context of these plants and the mobility, not just the physical mobility from the south to the north, but the class mobility that working within the context of the automobile, automobile excuse me, plant gave them but then also uh, the ways in which changes within um, the, the context of uh, producing automobiles then affected detrimentally the African-American labor, labor class and the ways in which between 1920 to 19 or 1915 really to 1967, you really see people coming in and um, having a series of jobs, not necessarily the best jobs within the plants, um, certainly jobs that were dangerous, certainly jobs that, you know, uh, put them at health risk, um, certainly contexts where housing was difficult and where the segregation within the city of Detroit caused riots and another kind of physical violence that um, took place both outside of and then even within in many contexts the actual plants themselves which became became over time racial battlegrounds because they really were um, these sites of contestation not necessarily because of race but because of an eco economic uh, mobility factor that they were you know somehow giving African Americans you you then kind of think through what that meant and to have this kind of um, Again, you know, you've mentioned fractions. That particular um, sculpture always lends itself into thinking through the mathematical and methodical way in which Shakaya creates. But I, I liken that to the mathematical and methodical way in which the tire production and car production took place on assembly lines, and the ways in which there was a rhythm to that. You know, that again, that musical quality also that you 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 see in Detroit um, really was extremely. Extremely um, conjoined because you had Motown, which arose, and I think you know we can't show this image, but you have an image of Martha and the Vandellas actually filming inside of the Ford Motor Plant as they're sitting on top of the Mustang, right? And so you have this kind of way in which both arose this um, this economic mobility and the cultural productivity and musical expression, um, and also you know political expression. Um, so much of what happened within the context of creating um, the tires and then creating the cars also meant that labor unions were formed. And I think in the context of this essay, to think through um, the ways in which labor unions were formed in churches and that churches had become the sacred space, the sanctuary for African-Americans as they were um, responding to and kind of dealing within uh, polarizing racial context in Detroit. Um, and again, yes, exactly, looking at um, the kind of marches, this March to Freedom, where Reverend C.L. Franklin is standing next to Dr. Martin Luther King, but you know, one may not know immediately that Reverend C.L. Franklin is Aretha Franklin's father. And so this kind of way in which, again, that relationship between um, the economic, the social, the cultural, and the political is truly evidenced in this moment in Detroit and is evidenced around the idea of the tire and the idea of um, the automobile and the idea of the, the physical and the economic mobility that this um, object allows for, or in many cases did not allow for. And so, you know, I found that in thinking through this moment, which, you know, they call the summer of 1967, the summer of Aretha, rap and revolt. And the, the three are thought of synonymously within the context of um, Detroit in particular in that moment. And it all in many ways converges around the automobile industry. And so I think within embedded in um, the narrative that Shakaya inevitably tells by using the tire, she is, is 
is automatically um, allowing us to think through those histories, to think through that history of resistance, to think through that history of um, ways in which uh, the tire itself, you know, both symbolized and um, allowed for, and then in many times uh, did not allow for African Americans to have the quote American dream. Yeah, and I think it's incredibly fascinating how you unfold all this in the essay and really show how incredibly charged of a symbol the, the tire really is in all these um, many perspectives that you just laid out. So um, thank you for providing this background. And you already mentioned that churches actually became this very important hub um, as part of forming unions, as places to gather, as places to, to uh, be social together. And there's actually a work in a show that uses the form of the cross. It's called Cha-Ching. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other hand, in your essay, you also mentioned a really interesting term that um, is the ritual of resistance that you compare uh, or you you make a comparison to uh, Shakaya Booker's mode of working and call it a ritual of resistance. And I was hoping you could elaborate more on these two aspects. Yeah, you know, um, and thank you again for, <laughs> for allowing me to go through this process. It was, it was an amazing honor to be able to think through it in the context of the essay. Um, but to, 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 to go back to this idea of the religious, um, which again, and can't be separated from the African experience in many ways. Um, because as I put forth in the essay, there, there is the idea of transcendence and the idea of transfiguration. And you know, in other works I'm thinking about, uh, such as um, Nomadic Dwelling and Destiny's Doorman, I'm thinking through the kind of totems that exist outside of and around shrines um, within the West African context and thinking about Dogon sculptures that is that are used within kind of ceremonies and ritual and and um, rituals that are rites of passage. But I'm also thinking about the ways in which even Shakaya talks about the tread and the scarification of the tread as a part of an evidence of a certain kind of change, a certain kind of uh, transfiguration that um, one goes through and um, in a ceremony, generally speaking of um, adolescence to adulthood in many um, cultural contexts and particularly African cultural context, which she says is another reason why she's interested in the tire, that it has not just this kind of range of blackness that is reminiscent of African skin tones, but then also the treads with, that are reminiscent of the ways in which scarification patterns um, uh, take place within the African context. But to think through the African-American experience is to think through the ways in which many of the African um, ceremonies then blended within the narrative of Christianity, right? The narrative that was more dominant within the United States context. So this idea that you have a group of people whose cultural and or musical and in many ways spiritual um, practices are rooted in Africa then becomes intersected with and symbiotic with the um, Christian experience. And the Christian experience is one where there's also the communion, a blood ritual um, that, that takes place on a regular basis. There also are icons and, and iconography, and obviously the most prevalent one is the cross. Um, and within the context of the African-American experience, what's so interesting is that you have the cross then being used by both um, European American and African American people um, who are then praying to the same God um, and in many ways for different things. And the ways in which um, this particular kind of protracted cross um, spoke to me and, and you know, this, this kind of um, cross that has these shredded, um, charred, um, methodically placed um, very sharp, you know, um, shards of tire 
um, which would obviously uh, hurt one if one were to lay down, but to really reminiscent of the crown, reminiscent of the crown um, that we read about Christ having worn on the cross, this crown of thorns, um, but then also these kind of two wheelbarrows on the side of it. And in many African-American churches, there are many songs and many kind of ways in which um, there is a metaphor for laying your burdens down that is synonymous with the wheelbarrow and synonymous Anonymous with, um, you know, laying your burdens upon the cross and laying your burdens upon Christ. Um, but it was interesting to me to think through um, the ways in which James R. Cohn, who wrote a book called The Cross and the Lynching Tree, um, really argued that um, the iconography of the cross was the same, you know, same symbol was used both to lynch African Americans within a particular time period, and the, that also was the symbol that African Americans prayed to for a certain kind of liberation, a certain kind of freedom, a certain kind of um, transcendence from one kind of experience to the next all happened within the context of this cross. The cross that um, in the context of the European American experience meant that you were, you know, hoping for and fighting for keeping your land and keeping segregated spaces was also the cross that African Americans were fighting for and desegregation and fighting for shared spaces and for economic mobility. So that it's a really ironic object and one that, you know, uh, for Shakaya to have engaged really felt like for me, it was uh, not just linking to that way in which there was this double um, entendre with the cross itself, but this relationship between capitalism and the cross, the relationship, the inextricable relationship between capitalism, the cross, and really the automobile industry. Because in many ways, if one even thinks about the histories of lynching, you know, and, and I think we had images of riots, but men being grabbed from their cars, you know, people, you know, driving from the south to the north and being grabbed out of their cars and, and, and lynched. And so the ways in which the car itself, the automobile itself is also been um, a part of that history. And then again, this 45 degree angle also felt like to me a way in which there was a reference between the rise and fall of an African American community in Detroit, that they had really reached a certain height. And then by the time um, the 1960s came, you know, and early 70s, the city, which is 83% Black, is filing bankruptcy. You know, you're thinking about, um, in that context, again, the ways in which um, the cross is inextricably linked to capitalism within the American context. Thank you so much for, for sharing this. Um, there was also an image of Rene Cox, I believe, that also uses the cross in a different way, but it's Mm -hmm. Yes, and in fact, Renee is actually much more direct when in using this image, um, it shall be named, but really thinking through again that that um, way in which the black male figure could be both seen as and, you know, within Renee's practice, always challenging the kind of ways in which a Jesus figure is rendered, whether it can be a woman, whether it can be a black figure, uh, but then also, again, within this context, thinking through um, the idea of lynching and the crucifixion as um, truly synonymous with one another. Um, so it, you know, it, it is not every day that I, particularly within the context of looking at contemporary artistic practice, I'm also able to engage with a, a kind of spiritual or religious narrative on multiple fronts. And what was so interesting is that Shakaya had done it and that there's, there's nothing else that object can be. That object can only be a cross. So you can only kind of engage with it within that context. And if we link back to that original image of her in the graveyard with the crucifix on her neck, with that kind of bone cro crucifix or cross sitting upon her, I really um, felt as though you know, you have um, you have the idea of spirit within many of these works, and um, some perhaps more obvious than others, but certainly within um, the context of uh, Cha Ching, that very um, I think uh, important conversation about the ways in which um, we 
have to always question the kind of rituals we participate in. Um, and in the context of religion, I think for African Americans, um, the religious practices um, of, you know, attending church and of engaging within a, so, a series of um, political activities outside of the church that are, you know, spiritually led. If you look at, the, again, those images of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and Reverend uh, C.L. Franklin, lots of the religious leaders were also political leaders and they sang hymns as they marched. They, they prayed before and they prayed afterwards. And so the idea of the ritual of resistance for me is really wrapped up in that the political and the, the um, spiritual experience within the African-American context are very much inextricably inter, you know, intertwined. Thank you so much. Um... I, there's actually a question that uh, from the audience and for everyone, please feel free to drop uh, questions in the Q&A here um, that this question here particularly, I think refers a little bit to what you had talked about previously. Um, and it asks about the uh, connection of the origins of the tires. I believe you briefly mentioned the Firestone Tire and Rubber Companies that owns a thousand, a hundred thousand acres of rubber trees uh, in Liberia. And um, the audience member is asking about the negative environmental and social consequences, as well as the, the um, labor included in that in harvesting this and um, how this might be part in, thought in relation to Shakaya Booker's work. I believe in your essay, you also reference uh, the actual region of the rubber in Liberia. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that more. Well, I, I hope I understand the question. And if I understand the question, then I think that um, the audience member is, is saying that they are, um, that they are questioning whether or not part of Shakaya's intent is to make comment on that situation. Is that or they're asking if she's considering these origins in the work. I think so. I mean, I think I think for her to have worked with this material for 20 years, she certainly thought about um, the origins of the tire. Um, but you, but her, the way in which she interacts with it can only be to kind of reclaim and can only be to kind of. Um, repurpose and reuse. And I think it is a part of a way in which she's trying to correct the, um, the impact of having made and produced those tires and having tapped that rubber. And again, the ways in which black bodies in that case, Liberian African bodies were engaged in that practice, um, you know, I think is, is, is part of her comment, is part of her intention around using the tire is that, you know, that labor, that way in which um, people were paid 72 cents an hour or 72 cents a day rather to work um, in order to tap those trees and uh, allow for those tires to be made should not be discarded. That that labor has to be acknowledged, that that labor has to be honored. And I think in the context of making these monumental sculptures really elevates um, the intention around having, you know, uh, tap the trees in the first place. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to really honor the labor and give it another life, so to say, in the sculptures. Yeah. Um, yeah, if there are no more questions from the audience, I was actually I'm just kind of looping back to the work of Shakaya Booker and um, all the different media. I kind of, um, I'm just actually curious myself and it kind of loops back a little bit to the question about the different themes in her work. Like, um, yeah, the question of giving a second life because we exhibited also paintings from the early nineties and it turned out a lot of them were actually also found canvases that she, Mm -hmm. uh, repurposed um, and I'm not really sure where I'm aiming with the question but it's just kind of this 
interest and continue to to engage with something you also mentioned the wearable sculptures which i believe some of them actually have like dried mm -hmm. orange peels on them mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um make sculptures out of bones early on i mean i think one of the things that i remember reading was her thinking about um the cost of materials and really kind of going for objects that were free or minimal cost because in order to make sculpture and to be able to you know make objects in and of themselves there was a cost attached to that that she didn't necessarily want to or or could kind of bear in that moment so you know the idea of the used canvas actually for many reasons around Jakaya, you know, is I think a part of the consistency around who she is, that she would continue to use something that had, you know, a previous life rather than to purchase something brand new in the same way that, you know, uh, she did with the tires and, and even with fabric. Mm -hmm. And I think it also speaks to a very specific moment in New York. I mean, she has lived in, in the East Village um, for a long time and um, I believe there's a story where she started collecting these rubber tires also from burned cars that were just in the streets. And I, I believe, I mean, New York was a very different city at that time also. No, I mean, certainly it's, it's, um, it's interesting to think about the changes that have happened in that area, but then also the kind of art historical discourse of that area and everything that kind of happened um, on the Lower East Side or in the East Village, you know, Shakaya describes it as riotous in many ways that there were always kind of these car crashes or car fires and that after the car fires dissipated, you would have this charred rubber, you would have these kind of tires and inner tubes or treads kind of left behind and I think that it's interesting to think of those objects also as having that history of having that history of the New York of that particular moment embedded within them as well, certainly. Yeah. Um, and then now she also works in Allentown, Pennsylvania, which is a whole other economic and social history in the US. Yeah. You know, I, I think that um, for Shakaya to have continued to think through um, this, this way in which one can be extremely brilliant and extremely beautiful, and by this I mean herself, sculptures, um, objects of art, and Black people, but then also not have moved fully into a certain kind of economic context or economic bracket, and her kind of way in which she's residing within a space that um, allows for both, allows for this kind of dichotomy of, um, of generating objects of high value and high worth in environments that may not even recognize them or may not even um, kind of acknowledge them as such in a particular moment because they are, you know, of that space. But it really, you know, as I think about it in the essay becomes a kind of um, a medium, those objects become a medium for a conversation around those economic contexts in, um, let's say, the museum context, for instance, right, or a gallery context, for instance, where automatically they've been ascribed a certain value, they've been ascribed a certain worth, they've been ascribed a kind of historical place, and, and her having physically produced them from objects that, or shreds of, of objects that um, come from a different economic sphere, I think is a part of a, a very interesting confrontation, a very, um, you know, reading about Chakaya's work from others, you get these the language around intimidation or the language around uh, a certain kind of um, uh, evocation of, of fear. And I think that comes maybe from the way in which uh, people perceive of a big kind of um, monumental size object that just also happens to be black. But, you know, Shakaya's personality is so gentle and she's so quiet in many ways and she's so shy in many ways that it's interesting when you think beyond ascribing um, the sculptures themselves, personality characteristics and think about the history and the materiality of the object, what really happens because they in and of themselves, I think are, are such um, 
informative objects. They have so much to tell us and they have so much to share with us in terms of who we are, what our contribution to culture, humanity, mathematics, music, all of that is. And I think, you know, Shakaya, I, I know that she will continue to be acknowledged. And this exhibition, I think, is a beautiful way to kind of begin what I think is a series of conversations around the importance um, and information that these objects share with us. Thank you so much. I think that's wonderful closing sentences that really give an outlook on all the conversations we still would like to have and um, yeah, continue seeing these really fantastic works. I really thank you so much for generously sharing your evening with us and um, opening up so many incredibly thoughtful and detailed perspectives on Shakaya's work. Um, really enjoyed the conversations and uh, I hope our audience did too. So thank you again. I would also like to thank the entire team of I say Miami, particularly Daniela Grenadillo, our digital producer for organizing this. Thank you first and foremost, of course, to Shakaya Booker for sharing these incredible works with us and for allowing us to, to put together this show of her works. Thank you again, Erin and thank you, so thank you to the audience oh thank you so much <laughs>